Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Outside Shore Music and welcome to the Music Masterclass. This is our regular series where we talk about creating music, talk about uh, composition, arranging, improvisation, all the creative acts of music making. So as we have been, we're going to be talking about counterpoint today. And specifically, we are now getting into the portion of the course where we are looking at a very I shouldn't say a specific, but a, a broad category of Renaissance forms uh, called the motet, and it's very related to um, other Renaissance forms, and that's what we're going to be talking about. But mostly, rather than the form itself, we're going to talk about its language, the melodic, rhythmic, and harmonic language of this, meaning how, how do the actual melodies how do the rhythms, how do the harmonies found in this music uh, differ from other types of music? Because um, if you're not familiar with Renaissance music, I mean, you've heard examples of it throughout the course and in other teachings of mine, but if you're not really like listening a lot to Renaissance music or studying it, there's, there's aspects of it that maybe are a little unfamiliar compared to other types of music that you maybe are more familiar with. And so this is what we're going to be focusing on is, you know, the things about uh, this type of music that we want to uh, understand. So I did put up a project to write a, a, a melody using the Dorian mode. Very simple little project, and I've got a few submissions we're going to take a look at. But before I do that, I want to address a question that uh, Kevin had asked here. So let me um, get this appropriately sized. There we go. Um, this question was about the lesson on the harmonic language. And by harmonic language, so first of all, if I use the term harmony in conjunction with Renaissance music, we're already on shaky ground because the term harmony implies things about chords and chord progressions and, and language that would not have resonated with the average Renaissance musician or composer. In the, the, the real it was more about just controlling consonants and dissonance. But there is no getting around the fact, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sharing my screen. So let me <laughs> let me get that happening first. I forgot uh, to get that happening. So give me one moment to bring up my fancier screen share thing here so you can see my keyboard and all. Forgot to get that going. Uh, so let me just get that happening and then we'll talk about what I want to talk about here. Uh, uh, a couple more clicks and I will be there. All right. And now screen share. Lovely. All right, there we go. Okay. So, um, what, uh, yeah. So the, the idea of harmony is really more about talking about consonants and dissonance and the available note choices. And the point that I have made kind of over and over again, but is going to bear repeating here, is if you want to have just two notes in a piece, so like you're just writing for two voices, we already, we've talked many times about the fact that, okay, octaves and fifths are the perfect consonances, thirds and sixths are the imperfect consonances. And, and most you know, well, there'll be dissonances in there to create tension, and then we're going to resolve to one of those. If you've only got two voices, we just talk about intervals. As soon as we have three voices, well, those remain the consonances, but we want to make sure that we have those consonances between all voices. So if we have a third and a third, then it's a, those two voices are consonant, those two voices are consonant, and it adds up to a fifth, which is consonant, right? So as long as you have a third and a third, you're good. Or if you have a third and a fourth, remember fourths are kind of special, but as long as they're not involving the bass voice, they're okay. So we have a third here and a fourth here. That also adds up to us. Now it adds up to a sixth between the outer voices. The point is that all the voices are consonant and what we have are triads. 
So like it or not, we're going to have triads. I mean, there's no disliking it. It's just the way it is, right? But so even if the word triad and thinking about that as a chord with a name isn't so much a Renaissance thing, uh, there's no getting around the fact that that's what we are going to have, our triads, because that's the way to get consonants. So anyhow, that said as our kind of broad background to what Kevin's question has to do with. His question had to do with a comment that I made in the lesson on the harmonic language of Renaissance music. And in particular, I'm talking about the modes. And we talked about Dorian being this mode here, right? All the, the white notes on the piano with D as our final. And yes, we can quibble about whether the notes go from D to D or whether they go below D also and come back up to D, different naming schemes, whatever. We're not gonna worry about that. We're just gonna say, if we're dealing with those diatonic pitches with D as our final, that is Dorian. So one of the points that I make in this video here is that, well, if we wanna have Dorian, um, the only, if all you have are white notes available, and of course keyboard instruments were not the thing, but the, that set of notes, the notes represented by the white keys on a piano, those were the basic set of notes that people have been using for many, many, many centuries. Um, you know, and so whether it was produced by a, a, a recorder or some other instrument or just the, the voice, really people just thought about those notes, that set of seven pitches, the diatonic pitches. So if that's the case and you want to have a melody that sounds Dorian, you can only do it in D. Because if you try to start anywhere else, if you start on A, you're going to get a scale that has a half step between scale degrees 5 and 6. Dorian has a whole step between 5 and 6. Similarly, if you want to have Aeolian, the only place to have Aeolian is on A. That's the only place where you're going to get that minor third, perfect fifth, and half step. Starting on A is the only place you get that exact sequence. Actually, that's not true. E gives you that too, but it starts off with a half step. But that exact pitch set of pitches, you can only get Aeolian starting on A if you only limit yourself to the diatonic pitches. So one of the things that at some point in the Renaissance, after they started realizing that other notes exist in the cracks, Right? Because the idea that we might need a C-sharp in Dorian mode just to have a nice sounding cadence, you know, they started realizing, okay, there are more than just those seven pitches, right? We're going to add these other pitches. And once people started adding those other pitches, they realized they are more useful than just to create cadences. What we realize is if we add a B-flat, then we basically get the Aeolian mode. All the intervals in this scale, D to D, but with a B flat in it, are exact same intervals that we would have in Aeolian, right? So um, Aeolian uh, is whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step. And that's exactly the same pattern we get if we start on D, but include a B flat. Whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step. I don't have that memorized, I'm just doing it as I'm doing it. So if we allow for a B flat, then we can make Aeolian happen on D, which is kind of nice because maybe you want to have a melody that sounds like Aeolian, but having it go from A to A, that's too low for a soprano, right? A, a true soprano is not going to want to sing that low A. They're certainly not going to want to go below that A, right? So a soprano might be happier singing in Aeolian if they could just do it starting on E, on, on D, or other pitches also. And same with like tenors, you know, so it's, it depends on your vocal range. And also, if you're writing for instruments, the ranges of those instruments. So people realized that they, they wanted to be able to have melodies in Dorian that didn't start on D, or or it didn't end on D. They didn't, they also wanted to have melodies in Aeolian that uh, weren't only centered on A, but be able to create Aeolian somewhere else. So 
long, long setup here, but I, I want to make sure everyone is familiar with all of this stuff here. The actual question then had to do with this example that I give in the lesson. And let me just play this example here, the first few measures. Turn my volume back up. That bit of example is essentially in D Aeolian, right? It's got the B flat. And the bottom voice, right? So it ends on this. It ends on D, but it has a B flat. Now, it doesn't happen to have a, a leading tone. I don't know if anyone singing it would have chosen to take that C in the alto part and raise it up a half step just to get a leading tone. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. Um, but it, this is basically Aeolian in D. Well, what if you want to create Aeolian in G? Now we're getting to the actual comment that, that instigated the question. If you want to have Aeolian in G, well, we're going to need another one, another accidental. We introduced the B flat so that we could have Aeolian, that half step above the fifth, in D. Well, now that we have that B flat, let's play a scale on G. This scale is Dorian. And again, you could work out the intervals, but it's got a minor triad in it and a whole step above it, right? So Dorian on G has an E. So if I have a melody here where G is the final and B flat is in my key signature, it's going to be Dorian. But if I want it to be Aeolian, I'm going to need the E flat, exactly as Allison is saying. So if my key signature has B flat in it, but I really want to have an Aeolian cadence in G, then I'm going to need an E flat to do it. And that's exactly what Palestrina does in the next uh, cadence. Let's move on. So that last cadence is a cadence into G and it's involving these E flats melodically. So it is essentially suggesting G Aeolian. By introducing that accidental E flat, he was able to create the sense of Aeolian mode with G as a final. So you, that is something you will see Renaissance composers do. Now they don't, you don't, you won't see like key signatures with like five sharps and all sorts of things like that. It was really fairly limited to saying, well, let's make sure we can create a Dorian mode on at least three or four pitches. Make sure we can create Aeolian on at least three or four pitches. You don't want too many accidentals because A, it just wasn't part of their thinking. They didn't have keyboard instruments with 12 notes on them, uh, uh, and at least not until late Renaissance, perhaps. But also, the tuning of those would have been unsatisfactory. Like if you tried to actually say, hey, now that I have an E flat and a B flat, I should be able to make a B flat major scale. And you could, but the tuning of it might not actually make you very happy. Um, because the, the way the instruments were tuned is different than the way modern instruments were tuned. Modern instruments are tuned in a way that tries to make all keys sound alike, but that wouldn't have been the case in the Renaissance. So, long answer to a question, and I'm not sure if there was a specific aspect, Kevin, that you were wondering about. I haven't seen if you're here um, and you want to clarify anything about your question, but I figure that that is worth going into. The fact that, yes, we can have Dorian on keys other than D. We can have Aeolian on keys other than A. And the way you do that is you introduce accidentals. And you typically will see no more than one accidental in the key signature. You'll see a B flat is as much because that allows you to move it by a fifth, right? Um, if Dorian is in D and you want to have Dorian in G, 
you only need one accidental to do it, and that moves your range by a fifth, which is great because if, if D is too high, yes, you could say I'll move it one step lower, but that's like barely worth doing it. Moving it a fifth is really moving it, right? Um, so moving it down a fifth basically means adding a flat, or moving it up a fifth would add a sharp. If you wanted Dorian on A, you would need an F sharp. So you will see pieces in this style with one flat or one sharp in the key signature. And it has exactly that effect of shifting all the modes by a fifth. Um, and then therefore you can, you know, different ranges will work. Uh, and then at most you will see one additional accidental being introduced to shift it further, like this E flat. Typically you won't see more than that. So if you're looking at Renaissance music, you want to be aware of that, be thinking about that key signature, not in the way we might think of a key signature. Oh, it just means it's in F major. No, it, it, it's, a, it's a system for essentially shifting the range of the modes so that your Aeolian mode doesn't start on A, it starts on D, and it shifts where that mode is. So, um, uh, that's something to be aware of as you read through Renaissance music, that think about the key signature in terms of how it affects the modes. Because you will see in any given piece, cadences in multiple finals, like this cadence here into D, that cadence into G. If we look at the rest of the piece, you'll see cadences into other notes also. Um, and that's just part of the way Renaissance music is constructed. You'll have cadences into different finals at different parts of the piece. So, all of that said, I wanted for our project to simplify this, because that is important to know. If you're reading music and trying to study existing music and understand what's going on, you absolutely want all of that background, which is why I wanted to give it again here. Um, but now, uh, I wanted us to practice writing melodies in modes. Well, Aeolian mode, right? Aeolian mode is just the minor scale. So we kind of already have practice writing in minor keys, right? And then we, we know how to use leading tones. I mean, if you've, take, if you've written any minor key music, studied minor key music at all, you've essentially used the Aeolian mode, the natural minor scale, and you've introduced leading tones, the harmonic and melodic minor scales, to use more modern terminology. So, and, and major, we're, most of us are very familiar with major. But Dorian is kind of the odd man out where, unless you've either studied Renaissance music or studied jazz or rock since 1960. We'll say 1959. I'll pick on 1959 as the introduction of the Dorian mode to popular vocabulary. Someone tell me why I picked on 1959. Kevin, I know you, you must know the answer. I think it's 59. Boy, I hope I'm right. Um, but what, when did like all jazz musicians become aware of the Dorian mode? That is the question for the chat and I will uh, um, I will answer that question after I see a comment. Um, so the Dorian mode is what I wanted us to try to practice writing some melodies in. And it's not just, can I write a note? And so I wanted to simplify it, not worry about the different accidentals that could be used. Let's just stick to the white keys with D as our final. Dorian with D as our final. And yeah, we'll have a C sharp in there for a cadence if we want. So I just wanted people to practice writing melodies in that mode, but not just um, uh, melodies in that mode, but melodies that would feel renaissance-y in other ways. And so I had a whole series of uh, kind of things to think about in creating your melody in terms of the durations of the notes, the intervals used, how it would fit the lyrics, etc. In the project I kind of laid out a whole bunch of things and what we're going to do is just take a look at some of the submissions here. And the submissions hopefully have those, yes, they have the uh, the thing, the uh, the concepts built into it. So I'm going to and it's going to be one of those days. Okay, and Kevin is absolutely right. The answer is So What by Miles Davis. That is the piece that put the Dorian mode on the...
map. That's basically the piece. It goes on for a while, there's improvisations, other stuff going on, but now you've seen the piece. And then his improvised solo is probably the single most transcribed solo in all of jazz history. It goes something like this. I messed up that little ending part, just doing it from memory. Um, Anyhow, that's Dorian mode, right? It's it's using the white keys that had B naturals, not B flats, right? Um, so, uh, um, oh, I oh, you know what probably happened, Sora? You probably tried to upload it to musicore.com, but it's still if you started with my example, then it probably was trying to upload it to my account, and probably you would have to change the uh, URL, or or it would say, do you want to create a new score or update the existing score? And you'd have to say, to create a new score, something like that. I don't, I don't really know. Anyhow, I'm going to go over, as someone else who actually succeeded in doing it could probably try to fill that in. What I'm going to do here is kind of read down what the uh, the considerations were, and then we're going to listen to the melodies. And I'm just going to try to read them. I said, choose a short, meaningful text. And I explained that, you know, traditionally that would be a biblical text. Use the Dorian mode. Start with long note values, like whole notes and breaths. That's generally what you see to an amazing extent. It really kind of surprised me, like I was going through this whole set of Palestrina motets, and there were essentially like uh, hardly any, no, I, I didn't even find one. <laughs> I didn't find one, I didn't look at every single one, but I didn't find a single one that didn't start with a whole note or longer note value. But the average note value is basically about a half note or so. And we can see that in the example that we are just looking at. You know, this isn't the beginning of the piece. It's the middle of, of it somewhere. But you can see this particular phrase starts off with brevs. And yeah, there's a bunch of half notes. And there's some quarter notes. And there's some longer notes than half notes. But the average note length is half note. And then... Uh, I talked about, you know, fitting the, the traditional voice leading guidelines, mostly steps, leaps occasionally, resolve them by step in opposite direction. If you do multiple leaps in a row, try to outline a triad. Again, that wouldn't be the terminology they would use, but that's what it works out to. And then try to fit the lyrics somehow. And then there's this whole thing about motets and similar styles in which because, because of all the counterpoint going on and overlapping voices, there's a lot of repetition of lyric, both between one voice singing a lyric and then the next voice singing the same lyric later, but also maybe that first voice singing that same lyric again and just getting a lot of mileage out of one line of lyric and stretching it out for a minute. That's a big thing in this type of music, so I wanted people to just practice doing that. Um, and then, uh, and I mentioned that, yes, even though we're talking about Dorian mode, you could possibly use a B flat if it, if it felt right and talked a little bit about where that might happen. And then at the end, introduce C sharp to have a cadence. So those were the constraints that I put on it. And then really, I didn't have any uh, other uh, ulterior motive here. I just wanted people to practice writing melody in this type of uh, genre. So we're just going to listen to a few of the submissions here, which I think all capture it really well. So this is Shelley's Dorian melody here. Um, um, will I try to sing along with it? No, I'm just going to listen to it. But the text is Mighty Oaks from Little Acorns Grow. And let's just take a look at that. Uh, might need to refresh. Sometimes I notice that if you leave uh, a musescore.com file open too long in your in your browser, when you press the play button, it won't work anymore, and you have to refresh the screen. Has anyone else noticed that? I, I definitely have. So I'm going to have to refresh this one. So give it a moment, because as we've all seen, while I'm streaming, everything else is uh, sacrificed uh, performance-wise. Da, 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 da. Um, so, um, 
while I, man, that's, that's taking more than just a little while. It's taking a crazy long time. Um, I will say that our next project is going to be to actually start writing a motet. And so we'll, I'll post some stuff about that up in a couple of days. Um, but uh, let's, um, man, yeah, this is, this is crazy. Um, hmm. I'm going to move on from Shelley's and see if one of the other ones that I pulled up more recently will play. Um, like Kevin's, I pulled up a little more recently. Well, that's weird. It looks like it's playing, but I'm not hearing anything now. What is going on? All right. In that case, forget it. I, I can play these melodies myself. I don't need to listen to music or play them, and I can sing them myself, right? So um, here's Sora's melody. Sora specifically mentioned that she was feeling um, long note values and uh, didn't really feel like getting into the quarter notes and melisma too much, but she did at the end, and so she said what she was doing, she did what she said, and I absolutely agree. So I'm going to just play this. So one, two... So, it's a lovely melody, very evocative, and you talked about, you know, what, uh, you know, it's a lamentation, and uh, it's the, the slow pace of it combined with the minorness of it, right? Dorian and Aeolian are minor type modes, whereas, you know, major is major, and it's all about how that F is, is minor sound. Now there's a couple of other things that you're doing that are contributing to the mood, but they definitely are a little outside of normal Renaissance tradition. You're actually using that tritone leap, right? So by using that tritone leap, it's definitely creating a particular sound that I have no issue with whatsoever. But if you wanted it to feel more Renaissance-y, that is one of the situation where a Renaissance composer might have chosen to use a B flat just to eliminate that tritone. They might use B naturals everywhere else in this melody because it's Dorian, but introduce the B flat just to avoid that tritone. I love that figure. It's a hemiola figure, right? It's this, it's the same figure. One, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. I'm counting it by looking at my heart as a phrase. It's a beat for my, two beats for heart. And then the next one is one beat for my, two beats for heart. And the next phrase is also one beat for my, two beats for heart. So essentially, it's a three beat figure, three, two time signature, but written in four, two. And so therefore it keeps shifting, right? The first, my heart starts on beat three of the measure. The next one starts on beat two. The next one starts on beat one. That's hemiola. That is absolutely the kind of thing you expect to see here. You expect to see that type of figure creating this syncopation and creating this blurring of the bar lines that I refer to in my demonstration, where the rhythms don't necessarily like in, in, in a lot of Baroque and classical music, you really expect there to be a strong downbeat focus and things aiming for downbeats. You're not going to see that so much in Renaissance music. It's the bar lines were a more modern invention. A lot of music was composed without bar lines. So, um, uh, they, there might still have been a fairly consistent sense of things, but a lot of music would have been printed without the bar lines. You also had another tritone. Where was the other tritone? Oh yeah, coming off that line. 
right? So that tritone coming down from that B to that F. And so um, the, uh, there's a certain dis well, dissonance associated with a tritone, and then hopefully you line it up with a lyric that, that supports it. So destruction, if you're gonna have a, a, a dissonant interval, the word destruction is like, um, uh, that's probably the best word you could possibly put, or one of, you know, one of the best words you could put over that tritone. Now, saying my heart on that tritone, you know, normally you'd say, oh, my heart, that's like, I, I like my heart. It's, it's all about love and things like that. Tritone doesn't feel like it fits, but it's not just about that lyric. It's about what about my heart? It's poured out in grief. So by putting that tritone there, she's really, um, emphasizing this grief. And so she's using that dissonance to really good effect, I think. And to me, totally fine. You know, I'm interested in learning what we can from Renaissance uh, forms and conventions and then applying them to our own music. And that might mean doing some things that they wouldn't have done then, but doing a lot of things they did do that maybe other people don't do now to, you know, enhance the range of what we can do in our music. So in any case, I totally approve of those tritones and everything else here is just really nice. This rhythm here is, I will say, quirky. The quirkiness of the, the syncopation there, oh, it's syncopation because if, you know, remember we're in three, in four, two here, ver and the are off beats. Over the destruct, so over the, the ver and the are half notes, but on the off beats, that syncopation. And so there's like two syncopated notes and then, um, then it switches to on the beat and then there's that tritone leap. So it's a very quirky figure, but again, given the lyric, not complaining, but I will say that that also feels maybe a little, I mean, obscuring the bar lines is a thing. Obscuring the beat, a little less so. When you see the syncopations in Renaissance music, it's more typically these hemiolas or the syncopation that happens because of uh, suspensions. Now, if this gets expanded into a piece with multiple voices, then maybe there are suspensions here and it starts to feel exactly right. So it's a little artificial to create melodies like we are here in the absence of other voices, but not really. I mean, certainly single voice music existed and continues to exist. And as a way of just exploring the mode, I thought was a, a good thing to try. So anyhow, great job, Sora. I am now going to return to Shelley's melody here. And um, I am going to uh, uh, do the same thing here. I'll, I'll see if it'll, if Musicore will play it. So Mighty Oaks, from Little Acorns Grow. Lovely. Yeah, so this this is what we're looking for. We're just looking for people to explore these ideas and how you're going to write melodies on it. And Shelley did a great job here, also starting off with long notes. But actually, I want to go back to uh, one thing also about Sora's that was worthy of mention here. She's starting with half notes, and not just any half notes, pickups. Mm my eyes with eyes as the downbeat. Now, to me and anyone else born in the last several centuries, that is the most natural thing in the world to do, have pickups into a downbeat. And my eyes, anyone writing a melody over the word my eyes would typically want to put eyes on the downbeat and have my be a pickup to it. That is absolutely the way we have written music for hundreds of years. I will say 
that again, when I was looking at Palestrina and other people's motets, this is not common. It is not common to start with a pickup. It is not common to start with these two half notes into that long value. It would be more typical to see my eyes and to see this actually be a long sustained note as unnatural as that might feel to the lyric and here's where well maybe latin just works differently i don't have a good enough feel for latin in english though this is the most natural thing in the world to do um, but i went out of my way in my example it was thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself and i held out the word thou way longer than I would have otherwise, simply to try to capture that aspect of how uh, Renaissance music is typically structured. So Shelley is starting off with half note, I mean a whole note on the beat, which feels a little more typical. So mighty oaks from little acorns. So we have the long notes being the one syllable. And, and so I wouldn't say it's worth changing it because you're already deviating enough in how you're using the tritone and everything and how you're mostly long values. I wouldn't change that at all. Uh, I would just say just something to be aware of if you're ever trying to write a piece that feels a little more connected to the uh, Renaissance Motet convention, then that would be something you could tweak. So here we have mighty oaks, one syllable per long note from, and then melisma, little acorns. So we have that quarter note moving passage where the melisma is. And then we get a nice rest. Rests are good. I, I've been talking about how, how rests are cool. And then little acorns grow. And this idea of repeating that little phrase. Sora did it as well with the my heart, my heart, my heart. And also at the end, it was a, a repetition. Here, Shelley is repeating little acorns and then little acorns grow. And now she repeats again. Mighty, mighty, oh, well, mighty oaks. Okay, that one threw me for a loop because I was expecting Mighty, I saw quarter notes and was expecting melisma, but she actually has syllables. Mighty oaks, that's not unheard of, but it's the, the, the thing that I had suggested is that when you have quarter notes, it's mostly gonna be for melismas. Well, it is mostly for melismas, but here's a place where she did choose to put lyrics, one syllable per note on her quarter notes. The thing that helps make that work is that there it's a lyric we've already heard before. And I really can't stress this enough that when we build an actual motet, and by the way, I'm not expecting that anyone would use their existing melody because chances are it's not going to be a good choice once we actually have to do what we do to build it into a motet. You might have to totally, you might be able to start with the same phrase, but then go somewhere completely different with it, or just pick a different lyric. You know, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But, um, uh, in the, once it's all put together, we're going to have all these different voices singing different melodies at the same time, different rhythms and, you know, lyrics kind of overlapping. One person singing one lyric while someone else is singing another lyric at the same time. Anything we can do to make the lyrics more understandable will be useful. And that often means starting off each line with only a single voice having that. And if you do something like this, where you try to put two syllables on two quarter notes, have it be a word you've already sung before. In fact, she just sang it in the previous measure. So that's a thing that helps make that work a little better. Um, so, mighty oaks from little acorns grow. All right, I know that's high for me, and but you know, whatever. Um, so, and she's got that nice syncopation in there. Um, and, and here's a thing that's like about how the lyric fits this. It makes total sense that it's a. a Let's see, one, two, three. It's B flat. Acorns. She waited 
till that last C-sharp for the corns. Um, that makes sense, because if she had tried to bring corns in on the C-sharp, corns grow. There's something about the syllable corns that doesn't want to be a melisma. Would you agree? There's something about the harshness of the consonant at the beginning and at the end of k and n, right? All those consonants there don't love a melisma. So if she had gone, hey, corns grow, that would have worked too, but I, I, I might have thought of it as a little harsh. However, if it had been any other syllable than corns, the, that sort of harsh consonant type of sound, I might have said, changing the syllable on the so that is all on the same syllable that might have felt a little more natural i say that off the top of my head i say that without verifying that so i'm going to tell you that right now i have a sense that that is true but the thing it makes me want to do is open up my collection of Palestrina motets and look at all of those little cadence figures and see, like here's one here. Um, does he use that figure? He doesn't actually use that eighth note figure in that little segment there. And this, this doesn't either. But yeah, if you, you, you'd want to actually go through a bunch of pieces and ask yourself, you know, does, is that thing that we were just talking about, um, that da 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 does that figure typically change syllables or does it typically stretch one syllable out? And then what are the characteristics of that syllable? Long vowel versus short vowel in English. Again, Latin has its own concept of how those vowel sounds work, its own concept of how those consonants work. So that's one reason why I'm doing mine in English because I don't, I don't have a good enough sense of, of Latin to get those answers right, you know, to, to really know, did this make sense? So I think in English, corns on there make sense. If it had been Latin, I wouldn't have known how to make that choice. Now those B flats, notice that she's using the B flat exactly as I described. It's an upper neighbor to the A. I talked about it in Sora's piece as a way of eliminating the tritone so that we wouldn't have that tritone but the other place that you expect to see the b flat is as an upper neighbor to scale degree five and the example that is always given or that i will always give every single time is green sleeves right that's the way most of us learn the piece with the b flat but if it was to be more purely dorian is also done. You will see arrangements that use the B natural. Historically, way too much is not known about that piece. For the longest time, people thought maybe King Henry VIII wrote it, but now it's pretty, pretty well established that it predates him. But as far as whether it would have had the B flat or the B natural, that information long gone. So you know, we can find the earliest written down version of it, but that doesn't prove where it started. So, um, so yes, yeah, she's using that upper neighbor B flat and same here. So it's using the B flat within the context of that upper neighbor to the A, but then using a B natural at the cadence and using B naturals for other phrases, right? Um, and here, right? So she's got B naturals, most of the places consistent with Dorian, but, um, B flats in the places where that makes sense. So I thought, think she did a really good job of setting up that particular situation and then executing it well. And yeah, it's just really well done. Love it. So um, there's a couple more modal melodies and I'm going to go to the, uh, that's, your, okay. So this is the other modal melody that was posted. And so Kevin McDonald, um, I'm a little less sure what you're actually doing here. Um, so I'm not sure if this was meant to be a submission for the canon or if it's meant to be a submission for the modal melody. It's not a canon, but it's more than a melody. So I'm not sure what's going on, but we're going to look at it anyhow and talk through it. What I will say is, uh, Kevin, I noticed you didn't put a title on your post. And so the, a couple other people I've noticed doing this also. So let me actually just, um, <laughs> uh show you something that maybe you've uh, some people haven't caught on to here when you create a post i'm gonna hit the new post button here 
when you create a post, come on, man, you'll see title optional to give it a title. And then it says, write something below it. These are two separate fields. The title is where you'd say, my modal melody. And then under here, you would type in, and so the title should normally just be a short little phrase like that. And then under here is where you write, here is the piece I wrote and some information about it, and then paste in the link to the score on MuseScore or a link to a YouTube video or whatever else you wanna do. Um, so that's what you expect is a title here and then the main body of your post below. And that way, when we look at it, we will see things like uh, the way Sora's is, the title was my mo or no, the title was modal melody, my eyes are spent, and then the body is what's down here. So every once in a while, I see people try to put an entire body up in the title, or I see uh, no title, and that makes it a little harder to sort out what's going on. So I thought I would uh, just maybe clarify that about how posts work. All right, so let's come back to Kevin's example, and I'm going to play this in little sections because I don't totally know what's intended here. Kevin, if you want to, if you're here and want to clarify, go for it. Otherwise, I'm just going to go with what I hear. I'm just going to play the first uh, seven measures here. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, no, I was looking to see if this is a canon in the in the middle voice. I can't tell, but I'm going to play it. I'm just going to play it. Oh, but this is the one that's not playing, and I still don't know why. Um, so if I want to play this one, I'm going to have to play it on the piano, perhaps, or I'll have to download it and get it in the Muse score. So give me a moment on that. But um, I noticed also he had a key signature with two sharps, and the, the chord was E minor. Well, that is, in fact, the right key signature for E Dorian. So it looks like he wrote a Dorian melody in E, which is fine. I had mentioned that typically you will see no more than one or occasionally two accidentals in your key signature. Um, so that's as many as you would see typically in Renaissance music and often not even that many, but totally, totally in today's world, nothing wrong with having Dorian in E. In fact, when I mentioned that Miles Davis piece, Oops, I the wrong rhythm, but it does that for like 16 bars, and then, and then it does uh, the same thing up in E flat for eight bars, and then comes back. So it's, um, uh, you know, in modern times, we know we can create a Dorian mode on any of the 12 pitches, but in Renaissance music, typically it would just focus on D or a fifth above or a fifth below. Um, uh, so anyhow, uh, yeah, it doesn't want to load. So um, I'll try opening it in another window directly on newscore.com. Yeah, something about the fact that it wasn't playing also, I'm wondering if there's actually something going on with this, but I thought I heard it before, so I don't know what to say. Um, so here it is directly on newscore.com, and let's see if it'll play here. Here we go.
All right, Kevin, that is a gorgeous piece. So I, I will say that I'm still not totally sure uh, what you're going for with this as far as, um, uh, let me float this guy, there we go. Um, as far as what the, the goal of this is, because it, it's not doing the things that I talked about, right? It's not doing the thing of like starting from a text, starting with long values, it's, it's not doing any of those things. However, that said, doesn't it have a renaissance -y feel to it somehow? So it is not feeling like a motet in terms of its arrangement of rhythmic values, but it feels more like green sleeves, right? I mean, it, it, as far as how the rhythms work, it's a song. Motets aren't songs, they're compositions in counterpoint, and that whole convention of starting with long notes, working towards shorter notes, melismas on the shorter notes, overlapping, all of that stuff is specific to the motet Gen not genre, form, but also masses and madrigals often have sections like that. And then madrigals often also have sections that are more song-like, like this is, this is song. Um, so the idea of Renaissance songs is absolutely a thing also. And that, I think that's what uh, Kevin has created here is a Renaissance sounding song. Now, what makes it sound Renaissance-y? Well, to me, it's the fact that, well, it is Dorian, right? It's got two sharps in the key signature and E is so. I'm just playing through those pitches. He has outlined essentially the entire E Dorian scale, right? There's an E, F sharp, G, an A, a B, a C sharp. There's no D, but at that point, that's basically as uh, that is the Dorian notes, and if you look at the uh, the next phrase, definitely has D naturals, right? So um, it's got D naturals uh, um, in the accompaniment part, and the next phrase. So it's very Dorian, and it is Dorian to the point of not having leading tones at all. There's not a D sharp at a cadence, right? That would have been something he could have done at this last phrase. In that last phrase there, he could have gone and put in that leading tone there, which again, in a motet type setting, it's expected. The cadences will do that sort of thing. That's helped, that, that helps put a period at the end of each line, at the end of each sentence, basically. The, the cadence with the leading tone, that's part of what the ear kicks up into. And again, that leading tone would not have been written in by the composer back in the day. That's why I talked about those uh, in, in my uh, score of the month uh, yesterday. A demonstration I talked about adding the accidental above the staff to indicate that yeah this is something a, a, a singer would have known to do on their own just raise that pitch at some point composers started writing them in also so in any case by not doing that and creating a situation where he actually wrote a D chord there he's making it very clear no I don't want a D sharp I don't want the singers singing a D sharp I'm gonna have a D chord here and that means the melody is literally gonna be this this is more purely Dorian right it doesn't have the accidentals that create those cadences and that also is super typical I mean if you think about uh, green sleeves, which I used as an example twice. Right? It's always going to have those guys, right? It's always, it, it, whether or not use that B flat on top, everyone does that thing. No one sings, no one, at least no one today sings that. I can't speak for 500 years ago. So Greensleeves does typically use that leading tone, but a lot of these songs, a lot of these folk songs coming from a modal tradition, um, there's a lot of like Irish folk songs and, you know, folk songs of, uh, yeah, European folk songs that are coming from a modal tradition will not have those leading tones. And so uh, that is entirely keeping here. So the things that make it feel renaissance is how purely it stays in that mode. Because if it did have that D sharp and C sharp, 
uh, you know, we would start saying, hey, that sounds like a modern minor key, um, you know, because that's harmonic minor, um, because it doesn't have the other attributes that guarantee that it's going to sound renaissance -y. Um, and it's not like there's this hard and fast distinction. This is renaissance and this is baroque -y. Um, uh, so, uh, in any case, it's, it's a very effective melody, very evocative of Dorian. It, it is not set up to do what a motet would want to do, but maybe that wasn't his goal in creating this. It definitely gives us a good sense of that Dorian mode. And, um, anyhow, I'm going to encourage other people to, um, you know, just do, if you haven't already tried your hand at one of those motets, uh, type Dorian melodies the way those first three uh, we looked at did. Go ahead and try to get some of those in because I do think uh, you will find it uh, just a useful little exercise. Even if you've written a million melodies before and you've written melodies, you've written melodies to fit uh, um, lyrics before, trying to do so specifically using uh, these concepts is probably new for most of you and I, I would just give it a shot. So in the couple minutes left here, I am just going to play through Graham's, uh, since I've seen your comments in here and I have it queued up, we're going to listen to your canon because you have both the uh, um, uh, outline and the canon. So we're going to hear your outline first. So, beautiful. When we're creating these outlines, we talked about the process for doing that. You have your, your options are going up by step or down by third if you're doing imitation at the fourth, which is what Graham is doing here. And I will point out that this idea of our outline going up a step, then down a third, and alternating that throughout, I think like 80% of you have exactly that same outline. <laughs> uh, you're not necessarily all starting on scale degree three. You might be starting on other scale degrees, but everyone has that same basic outline of up a step, down a third, exactly. Not just in any order, but in that exact order. Up a step, down a third, up a step, down a third. And yeah, everyone has come up with such radically different sounding canons from it. So uh, the interesting thing about Graham's here is that he's using a motif that's quite reminiscent of the invention that uh, that he had written previously. So if this sounds familiar and you haven't listened to this already, it's because there's some aspects of it that are quite reminiscent of, um, of the previous invention of his. But now let's hear the completed canon. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's just more great stuff going on here, right? It's, it's a very distinctive figure that then when the other voice takes it up, it's, you know, it's very obvious. Oh, someone else has come in with that same melody, which is what you generally want, which is why it's kind of odd to me that with a motet, that long note value is so typical as a start. But I guess maybe that works the same way when you hear a new, new voice enter with a long note. That gives you a clue. Hey, that's the same figure that um, that the piece started with, right? You you hear a long note and you're like, oh, that sounds like the beginning. The beginning was a long note. I normally, you know, in a Baroque piece, you normally think about distinctive rhythms, but long notes are distinctive also. And so that Renaissance motet style, starting with a long note, has kind of the same overall purpose. So in any case, there's some really nice things going on harmonically. Like I love this little passage here, this kind of chromatic passage. Right? If I, pa if I parse through what's going on here, this chord at the end of the measure, a G natural, an A, uh, a, G, a G natural, D sharp, A sharp, this is, um, now, Technically, instead of G natural, that, let me think about that, should be F double sharp. Uh, because this is a cadence into G sharp minor, 
G sharp, A sharp, B, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp, or F double sharp, G. That's why double sharps exist, um, to give us that leading tone and make it clear that it is a leading tone. So this guy really is the leading tone, F double sharp, but you know, spelling wise, I, I, I see what's happening. So this is the seven chord in, or is it even a dominance? It's, um, this is the five chord. It's the D sharp triad, D sharp, F double sharp, A sharp. Looks like E flat, but you know, if we spell it with sharps, that's how it is. Um, so it's a nice little quick tonicization there. I, I love it. Now, the fact that he does it with a chromatic line going up like that, I will say that that isn't something you see quite so often, that really quick uh, tonicization like that as far back as Baroque music, but it's definitely a big thing now. So it's absolutely nothing. Uh, I love that sound personally. So anyhow, beautiful work. Um, and uh, so again, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Let's come back and play out my theme music and see if it stutters too badly. But yeah, could be worse. Wow, my volume control is not even working. Um, Wow. I need to reboot, apparently. Okay, um, so thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for the comments. And um, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, let me just, there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, if you haven't done your modal melody, go ahead and just go through it. It's an interesting practice. And uh, I will be posting stuff later on talking about the process of actually starting to build a motet. But don't expect that your modal melody is going to become your motet because you will find it's not going to work in canon with itself unless you plan ahead for it. So we will, you know, I will give you specific direction on creating uh, the uh, motet, and it's going to be very built upon upon what we've already learned about creating canons. So if you haven't done the canon exercise, highly recommend that as well. All right, I will, uh, if you are caught up, by all means, just comment on other people's, ask questions, give suggestions, just say great job, whatever. See you next time.